And our lesson today is entitled, Faith Tested. And for the sake of making sure everybody online watching with us, which, hello, how you doing? Um, I will be reading all the biblical passages just so they're actually heard. So, Job chapter 1. I am reading out of the English Standard Version, which is different from the CSB, which is used in our personal study guide. So, Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. <clears throat> and very many servants, so that the man was the greatest of all the people in the east. This, his sons used to go to hold a feast in the house of each one in his day, <clears throat> and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast were on their course, Job was, uh, would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job, <clears throat> for Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. So before we actually get into the beginning of our lesson, which the study guide has for us, I want to kind of give you a brief overview of Job. And the first two chapters of Job is all about kind of a prologue to what the book of Job actually contains. And it's this big old long conversation between him, three friends, another friend, and God which actually the book of Job holds the longest dialogue God has with one individual, which is weird because they're like, we have the prophets though. Well, the prophets are just repeating what the word of the Lord has said, but this is God actually looking down from heaven and speaking directly to someone, and that is getting recorded. So to be Job, it's pretty cool. But anyways, <clears throat> what are some descriptions of Job that we see in this, in the first uh, five verses, what are some things that that it says that he has or that he is? What are, what are some of those things? Yep, had abundance. Man had a lot. What else? What does it say about him? At the end of verse three. Yeah, greatest of all the people in the east. Now, granted, this is at the beginning of time. There weren't too many people. But to be known as the greatest of all people in your area, that's not bad. That's not too bad. What else does it say? He would regularly sacrifice for the possible sins of his children. Now, I don't think that's something that we do all the time. Not, of course we don't sacrifice. We're not under the law anymore. But I know for me growing up, my mom would always pray for um, making sure that I had what I needed, that I would get married, I'm still waiting for that. <clears throat> and plenty of other things just, you know, that God would provide for me. But I don't remember her ever praying for the sins that I might have committed that she doesn't know about. This is a different kind of just dedication to what Proverbs talk about and training your child in the way they should go so that they might not depart from it as they get older. It shows that Job has his mind fixed on God entirely. He knows where all his blessings and all his good stuff comes from. And it's this thankfulness that we really see kind of just kind of pushed under the rug during the rest of the book because the rest of the book's kind of like he's feels like he's just whining about all these things and his friends which we'll kind of get into are just like dude what what did you do that could have possibly done this but one thing though is I want to quote uh, Jerry Bridges from the book Respectable Sins which by the way good book do recommend it will really kind of change your uh, uh, your outlook on the little things that we kind of don't think about too much. 
And it, he says this about uh, thankfulness. Quote, giving thanks to God for both his temporal and spiritual blessings in our lives is not just a nice thing to do. It is the moral will of God. Failure to give him thanks due to him is sin. It may seem like a benign sin to us because it doesn't harm anyone else. But it is an, uh, but it is an affront and insult to the one who created and created us and sustains us every second of our lives. And if, as Jesus so clearly stated, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind is the greatest and first commandment, then failure to give thanks to God as a habit of life is a violation of the greatest commandment. Now, the first time I read that, I was just like, what? Me not thanking God is a sin? And one of the things that comes to mind is that the story of the, of the, the 10 lepers that get healed by God and how many of them come back and thank Jesus. One. How many do we not hear any more about? Yeah, the other nine. Why does this one stand out to us? It's because he thanked Jesus for the healing he gave to him. He did what we're supposed to do. In Leviticus, it talks about giving a thanksgiving offering, which is something, one of the, the uh, uh, sacrifices that is not required, but expected. And it's little things like that that Job gets. He understands that everything he has comes from God. And we'll see that someone else is also seeing all these things that Job has. Enter the most wonderful person in all of Scripture, good old Satan. Let's start in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on earth, from walking up and down it. And the Lord said to Satan, I know what you're doing. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house that all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went up from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm going to say something. Don't hold it against me. Satan makes a good point. Of course, Job loves God. He's been continually blessed by God. In any good circumstance, we're not going to be just like trying to just go off and to do whatever. You know, if our mind is turned towards thankfulness to God and we think and we know that all these good things come from God, of course we're going to bless him. What, what else would we do? I mean, it's, it's Satan's not wrong here. He's not wrong pretty often. But what he does is he tries to manipulate God. And we'll see kind of in the next section what all he does. By the way, it's a big doozy. <clears throat> but we'll, we'll see these things and we'll just go, well, why, why are we going to now shift? Job has all these things. Of course he blesses God. But just a reminder, a lot of times for us, especially for me, 
if I get in this kind of very comforting, just level of, I have all I need, I don't really need too much else, I'm pretty content, my mind goes kind of away from God. I don't really think about him too much, which also, in respectable sins, Jerry Bridges also points out, that is ungodliness. If I'm not constantly putting my mind on the things of God throughout the day, just and it can be in various simple things, and it's just like watching a show and thinking, huh, that kind of has a biblical theme in it right there. Or if I'm reading a book, such as Respectable Sins or any other book that I'm currently reading, uh, a lot of times I can, there are so many different things I can find in it that points me back to God. And if I'm reading scripture, of course, it's going to point me back to God. But then we kind of go off and do other things, like watch sports. I don't normally think about God when I'm watching sports because a lot of the teams I support are pretty bad. I'm not thinking about God. I'm thinking about why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z? That will make you win the game. And that's kind of where it gets me. If I'm in that kind of content era area of my life, my mind isn't too focused on Job. Uh, excuse me, on God. But Job is focused on God the whole time. Again, it's another gold star for him on the board of righteousness. This man's got it down. He knows exactly what to do, when to do it, how often to do it, to a T. The thing is, there is no written law down. This is during Moses' time. So he's just doing all of this out of the thankfulness of his heart. I don't think you realize that's huge. That's huge. Because I don't. And I'm supposedly a leader in this place. How much greater can all of us be if we kind of took on that mindset of just continually being thankful for every single thing that we have? Our TV, our sliced bread, the children that we have, that we're raising or have raised, the, the wonderful house that we have, the job that we have, even though it might feel you know, unfulfilling at times, we have a way to continue living. As all good and perfect things come from God, where there is no shadow, there's no darkness. Job's got it down. And then we get to verse 13. So the next section... <clears throat> We're in uh, verses 13 through 19. I want to ask a question before we get into this, though. <clears throat> but why is it important for believers to remember that while we may be surprised and shocked by sudden calamities, God is not and he is in complete control? Why is it important for us to remember that? Is The study guide points this out. We don't hear from Satan or about Satan after the first two chapters. That should say something. Satan comes before God, kind of like uh, if you've seen Clash of the Titans, um, where Zeus and all the other Greek gods are around trying to figure out what's going on with the people, and, and Hades kind of slumps in, just like, I have an idea. That's kind of what this is like. Is he, Satan just kind of appears just like, hey, I want to do something, shake things up. I'm getting bored. And God's like, all right, we'll see what happens. Now, that's just a very, very poor personification of it. But that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of it in a sense that Satan still has to approach God. Just like us. That's a whole nother thing in itself that we don't have time for. But Satan's only mentioned in the first two chapters. Even in God's whole big spiel at the end of the book, Satan's not talking. Satan's not there. So, and I hate to keep on bringing it up, but this whole big old fun pandemic that we've been 
sitting through and we're finally, woo, finally beating it. I didn't catch God by surprise. My uh, grandmother, a couple years back, took a tumble and had a, a blood clot in her leg shoot straight up to her brain and kill her a few weeks later. I didn't catch God off guard. My, uh, my good friend who was working an event had a miscarriage at the event. I didn't catch God by surprise. There's nothing in this world that doesn't go by God because he is in control. So what is this stuff? What's this bad stuff that we keep kind of beating around the bush or the hedge, as Satan greatly put it? Well, let's get into it. We're going to be <clears throat> in verses 13 through 19. This is called Attack Executed. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck them down and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another servant and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants <clears throat> with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind across the wilderness, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck down the four corners of the house. It fell upon the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Boom, 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 boom. What? Whoa. Give me a second to breathe here. These people are telling the bad news to Job, and while they're finishing, they're still talking, they're finishing telling him what to do, another person comes up and tells him, hey, this other bad thing has happened. That is like, if you look in the dictionary at bad day, you look at Job chapter 1. That's a bad day. Because it all happened in a day. Within a few hours. Because especially in the time, they didn't have too much. And looking at the text, all the animals are gone. Every possession Job had, gone. So they had to run. So this was like attack, attack, attack. And they all, just one person survived each attack. Now, there's a question here that I want to ask that I find very interesting to hear uh, what some of y'all have to say. And it is found on page 16. What can believers learn about the timing, suddenness, and severity of Satan's attacks from these verses? These three, these three attacks that all pretty much happened simultaneously. What can believers learn about Satan and how he works with all, with just everything that we've just read? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important. You said that, that God gave Satan the authority to do that. Satan, again, he had to approach God and see what he could do and get away with. Still. God is still in control. It, and we'll kind of get into it in just a second, but it's, it's big to, to really get that down. So anything else? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because how many times do we go through something, go through some kind of trial or tribulation or whatever, and the first thing is, I could have done this better. I could have, you know, A, B, C, whatever it is. I could have done this better. And it even says, one of the servants says, 
fire from, of God fell from heaven. So they're even looking at that, just like, hey, God did this. And it's just, he's hiding behind that. And it's just, uh, uh, so much here that we can see about it. And we can get from just looking at how it's all sudden, it just happens back to back to back. And it's severe. Because that's what Job appro- or, uh, Satan approached God about. It's like, hey, Job's blessed. He's got all this stuff. Of course he praises you. What does Satan go for? All his stuff. And to kind of point back, it says that in the, in the, the uh, study guide, uh, when it says, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from going fr- to and fro from the earth. And it's just like the study guide points out that 1 Peter 5.8 says that Satan prowls around like a lion, seeking someone to devour. When you see, if you've ever seen anything on National Geographic, you've probably seen some of those African savanna wilderness shows to where you see these lions come up on these, just like maybe sometimes one gazelle, and they just hop on it and kill it, and that's lunch. That's how Satan works. If we're off by ourselves, we're doing our own thing. Eh, pretty easy target. He's not care- he's not caring about anything. All he's doing, sitting watching shows, playing video games, and reading Harry Potter. It's time to get him. But again, going back to Job. Job's mind before all this, we haven't read how he's reacted yet, but before all this, Job is doing everything he can to think and give thanks to God. Everything is centered around God. And now all his stuff's gone. His own children, all 10 of them, it's bad enough, it's bad enough to lose one child. Job just lost all 10 of his children. He's lost all his tens and thousands of uh, cattle and livestock. He's lost so much. So at this point, we're all thinking, all right, Job, what are you going to do? Because for me, if it's one thing after another, I'm not going to be thinking about anything else other than, "Ah, I, I can't, I can't get through this. Just the sheer aggressiveness, aggressiveness of all this ambush of just one thing after another. It's, it's going to discombobulate us a lot of times. It's going to make us kind of just get confused and our mind's just going to be wandering off. Kind of what I said earlier, it's like, oh, I could have done this better. I could have done this better. Or even, you know, God, what are you doing to me? Why do I deserve this? What have I done? So many different things can go through our head. And a lot of times, for a lot of people, it's just like, God, I hate you. I hate that you have done this to me. But there is hope in this situation, which is crazy. Job does something different that a lot of us don't do when we encounter huge, huge suffering. So let's finish up the section of the chapter is, and read verses 20 through 22. Then Job arose right after everything he had just heard. Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground, and what? Worshipped. What? You did what now? All this stuff, just all this terrible stuff just happened, and you're worshipping God? What's going on, man? Verse 21, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, 
I mean, all we had to do was just read that one verse, and we can kind of we can kind of go off on it because it's just so much in Scripture that kind of focuses on this verse that you can see throughout all every book in the Bible. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. If every good and perfect thing comes from God, if everything, if God created, first off, if God created this earth and everything we built has also come from this earth. So all the, the materials that were used for this building, even the weird stuff that makes plastic, if everything has come from this earth, that means God has provided it for us. Including each other. Our families, our friends, the people we see in the grocery store, that we see when we go to watch some sports games, when we go do anything. Every single thing that our eyes see is created from God. Job's got it right. And a lot of times, I don't. And I'm also going to go on the assumption that you guys don't as well. Because it, if I was hit with something as severe as this, like I said earlier, my mind's not going to be on God. But look back to what Satan said in, a, in verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? No. There's a reason. This is the reason. Verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. When I die, I brought nothing into this world, and I'll take nothing with me. The Lord gave me everything, and the Lord has taken away everything. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whew. That's a lot. That's big. And that's something we don't get. And it's hard. It's hard to go through things like this and just go, man, God is so good. Because it doesn't look like it. So I got this little book called The Ultimate Bible Guide from Falls Creek, and it's published by Holman, which is the creators of the Christian Standard uh, Version or Bible that we use, the CSB. <clears throat> and it has this to say about this word, theodicy. A theodicy is what the problem of evil is. That's what theodicy is. It deals with the problem of evil. And the Ultimate Bible Guide says this, and quote, Simply put, the matter is this. Since humans, especially the seemingly innocent, such as Job, suffer pain and evil, then what kind of God must there be? Job reveals a wider arena than humani humanity can observe, such as going to the throne of God, seeing Satan come in, which, by the way, if this doesn't tell you that the Holy Spirit tells us everything we need to know through the writing of the Word. I don't know what else does because we can't peek into the throne room of God because that's in a whole other dimension. <clears throat> but, but get this. The conflict of the ages between God and Satan in the end demonstrate both the righteousness and supremacy of God. From a merely human point of view, the answer to the question of evil, <clears throat> the answer uh, from a mer merely point of view, the answer is that there is no given answer to this problem of evil because we can't see it. We just see all the bad stuff. We see the circumstances around us. We can't see the forces behind it. Sometimes it's just malicious people around us that want to cause us harm. Sometimes it's a natural crisis. All these different things we don't know about because we're too busy in the emotion of the moment. But from a divine perspective, 
the answer is that God's glory is served even when evil is permitted. God is not the one who causes evil to happen. God is the one that allows it. Why would God allow it, though? I'm glad you asked. Let's all turn to James chapter 1. But there is a certain part of James chapter 1 that we like to quote a lot. And it is verses 2 through 4. And then I will also be reading verse 12. And it says this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. What does this have to do with Job? As Dwight pointed out, uh, which we won't talk about uh, next week, but in, ver in chapter 2, um, Satan goes back to God and he says, Hey, Job can, Job can still hate you, you know. He, he's not that great. And God's like, okay, what do you want to do? He's like, let me, let me take away his health. God says, okay, I'll allow it. And so what Satan does is he gets these nasty boils all over Job and makes him, brings him to the point of death, but doesn't kill him. And this is probably looking at the severity and the suddenness of everything that Satan has done before, probably not too, too far along in the timeline to where this happens to Job. So now all his stuff's gone. Now he's got these nasty boils and he's close to death. And his wife, such a, such a lovely woman, <clears throat> looks at Job and says, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. What a lovely woman. So, so caring. See, there are people in our life that they... They don't know it either. Not everybody knows this perfect answer. And they could be somebody that we're very close to. However, as the story goes, Job did not. Job did not curse God and die. And the sad thing is, a lot of times when we're hit with such huge trauma, a lot of people think death is the only way out. Just this past year, suicide rates in teenage girls alone increased exponentially because of the isolation that all the quarantine stuff brought us. Suicide rates went up as well, but especially teenage girls, they increased exponentially. For me, having a sister that's gone through a lot, that hurts me, especially since I'll be going and uh, replacing Tim for the summer. That's majority of the group. Suffering's not this thing that's just like uncommon. It's everywhere. So what? What do we do? Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, James is not saying you don't know this, you know this, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Mm. How often do we gloss over that? How often do we encounter bad times and we're just like, ah, I can't handle this. Great. 
turn to God. Because he can. If he's allowed it to happen, he's also going to be there for you before, during, and after. God is faithful always. And a lot of times we look at this and we're just like, well, of course, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't look at God any different. I, I, I can't look at him the same. If he allowed this to happen, he's not a good God. He is. Because we're not going to go through any, probably, most likely, I can't speak for everybody, but we're probably not going to lose everything we have in the span of a couple hours. A lot of times that happens, though. A fire rakes a, across a neighborhood, tornado, hurricane, families lose everything. And we may think, I can't believe this has happened. What am I going to do? That's why Job is here. Job is here to show us that even though everything was taken away from him, he still turned to God. Still. Mm. I don't think you guys are kidding it. Because I don't. Because I definitely don't turn to God very often when I encounter trials of various kinds. I don't. I throw a pity party. It's pretty sad because it's just me. That's not a good party. But a lot of times we just, we just get all this stuff. Our anxiety and our thoughts just go everywhere. We get just all kinds of anxiety attacks. We get depressed. All the different psychological words I can throw in there to just say, you're having the worst possible time ever. But Job worshipped. Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. That is a steadfast, upright, and righteous man. Philippians 4, 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Paul then goes on in chapter 4 of Philippians to talk about the different things he's gone through. Being shipwrecked, being hungry, being chased out of towns. To where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Meaning, no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Christ, God, the Holy Spirit is my strength. I have no strength other than God. So, let's look at the points of application on page 18. So how do we take this and apply it to our lives? Number one, Satan seeks opportunities to attack God's faithful followers. A lot of the times, though, it's just your own heart which is why Paul also tells, us, also tells us to guard our heart. Believers are not immune from experiencing calamity and loss. Bad things happen all the time, whether it's brought on by someone else or by natural disaster. It's always here because we live in a fallen world. And the third point, believers can worship God even in the midst of life's challenges, knowing that he is sovereign. It's tough because even the small things we go through, they're big to us sometimes. Our emotions get caught up in it. We have a flat tire, whole day ruined because now I got to get my spare. Now I got to do this. Now I got to call a tow truck maybe. You know, there's so much little things that can happen that just cause us 
just so much to spare. God's still present in all of that, the big and the small things. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are good, and we praise you for your goodness. God, we thank you that nothing escapes your sight, that you have the authority over all things. And no matter what may happen, God, you use these situations to test us. As Romans 8 says, that all these things work out for our good, God. The good and the bad things that happen so that we may be more conformed to the image of your son. God, we love you and we praise you. Help us to always keep you on our minds and give us a desire to always praise you because that's the best thing that we have, God. I pray all this through your son's holy and precious name. Amen.